Hello, everyone. Um, we're so glad that you're here for today's Wednesday webinar. Um, the topic for this month, for October, as it always is, is filing the 2324 FAFSA. Um, I'm Myla Tappan. I'm the Manager of College Access and Outreach at the Finance Authority of Maine. And with me today is Mary Dyer. And Mary is the Finance Education Programs Manager at FAME. Mary's going to wave hello away, right? <laughs> uh, Mary will be monitor monitoring the chat and the Q&A. So if you have questions as we go through the presentation today, please ask them in that way. I'll stop periodically for questions, but we do have a lot of content today. So I probably will hold off. Uh, Mary, certainly if you think there's something pressing that I've not maybe been clear on or there's confusion about, jump in at any time. Um, we will at the end answer any questions that we can. Um, and we'll put any in writing that we don't get answered during today's session. Um, so you will be receiving a follow-up email. The follow-up email will have a link to the presentation, any other resources, as well as answers to any unanswered questions. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. So today's agenda is that we're going to talk about first the FSA ID, uh, because you can't really talk about the FAFSA without talking about the FSA ID. And then we'll focus on filing the 2324 FAFSA. I just want to say at the beginning that there are significant changes coming to the 2425 FAFSA. At least that's what we've understood to date. I've been hearing rumblings the last few days that there's some concern about whether the Department of Ed is going to be able to pull that off for next year. Um, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about what the rules are for 2324, and then I'm going to mention a few areas where we know that there are changes coming that we think are coming in 2425, um, but who knows? We'll see, and we'll keep you all posted. But let's start first by talking about the FSA ID. Now, when you're creating your FSA ID or when students are going to file the FAFSA, every single student needs to have their own FSA ID. So that's a given. Every student needs to have one. If the student is a dependent student, so if parent information is required on the FAFSA, then one parent will also need an FSA ID. The parent will need that FSA ID to sign the FAFSA and to use the IRS data retrieval tool. Now, if you're wondering who's considered a dependent student, one of the resources I'll be sharing in the follow-up email <clears throat> is our Get Ready Checklist. And on the back of our Get Ready Checklist, it has the criteria that determines whether or not a student is considered independent or dependent. And we'll be talking about that some as we go through today's session. But if a student is dependent, one parent will need an FSA ID. There's some thought that when these new changes are implemented, that maybe both parents will have to, but we're not sure of that yet, but that's one of the things that we have heard. Now, keep in mind that an FSA ID is tied to an individual's social security number. So an individual only has one FSA ID, even if they serve in a couple of different roles. So for example, I have an FSA ID and I got the F an FSA ID primarily because I needed to sign my kids FAFSA as the parent. So I used it for that purpose. But if I were going to go back to school myself, or if I had outstanding federal student loans and I wanted to log into studentaid.gov, I would use that same FSA ID because it's tied to me. So sometimes um, we're actually not sometimes, we're regularly seeing parents these days who have created an FSA ID so they can look at their own student loans, or maybe they had um, an older child already go to school. So they created an FSA ID a couple of years ago. They're going to use that same FSA ID for their younger student. Now, because the information is tied to the social security number, it's super important that people keep track of that information. I'm one of those people who I have two Apple IDs because I messed one up so badly that I just went and created a second one. But we can't do that with our FSA IDs. Because they're tied to our socials, we can only have the one. So writing down the information associated with that is really, really important, and we encourage people to do that. Now, of course, they want to make sure they keep it in a safe place. Don't leave it out where people can get access to it, uh, but jotting down that information is, is important. We do have a form, our FSA ID information tracking form, that I will also send along. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with it, uh, but if you haven't seen it yet, um, please share it with um, any students that you're working with if that's a convenient way for them to keep track of that information. 
We do recommend that people get their FSA IDs ahead of time. You certainly can have the first step in filing a FAFSA on a given evening, um, be getting an FSA ID, but for all sorts of reasons that I'll kind of allude to as we go through this presentation, it is really beneficial if the student and parents can get the FSA ID ahead of time. For one thing, it just breaks it down into a couple of steps. And when we break things into chunks, I think it seems a little bit easier for students and for parents. So when you go to create an FSA ID, or if you want to log into studentaid.gov, you're going to go to studentaid.gov, and here you'll have the opportunity to click on create account, and that is where you will create an account. Um, so studentaid.gov is where the FAFSA is housed, it's where everything related to public service loan forgiveness is related, is going to be found, it's where all federal student loans can be found if a student wonders whether they have had a Pell Grant, they can create account and log in. This is where all of that information is housed. So what I'm going to do <clears throat> is I'm going to go through the screenshots for creating an FSA ID. With today's session, I am going to move pretty quickly. Again, it's recorded. So if you have questions, you can come back and listen again um, or reach out to me directly. But I have put a lot of screenshots in here, mainly because I want you to be able to have them for, for reference. I know that I do the same thing. I keep a copy of this presentation and I refer back to it. So if I want to remember exactly how a screen is laid out or what the exact wording is on a screen, this is my reference point. Um, so for that reason, there's, there's a lot of screenshots that we're going to go through quickly here. So when you log in to start creating your FSA ID, it tells you who's going to need one or what role you might be in um, when you're going to use one and all of the things that it can be used for. So filing the FAFSA, certainly, but signing promissory notes, applying for repayment plans, doing loan counseling, counseling or using the um, public service loan forgiveness tool. Now, anyone who has loans and might be eligible for public service loan forgiveness, be sure that you're aware of the waivers that are currently existing that expire at the end of the month. And if you have questions about that, please let us know. To create an FSA ID, you have to have your social security number as well as a mobile phone number and or email address. Um, and you can only use an email address or phone number once. You can't use them um, repeatedly. So if you're gonna create an account, you click here. You're first going to provide your personal information. It's important that students know that they need to use their legal name or parents need to use their legal name. Um, they want to use whatever is on the social security card because it's going to be matched with the social security administration's database. Um, and if it doesn't match, that's gonna cause some potential issues. So be sure this is one of those times to pull out the social security card and be sure that the information is being entered exactly as it is listed on the social. And of course, make sure the date and the social security number are accurate. This is not a time when we want a student to guess about what they think their social security number is. We want them to pull out the card if they're not 100% sure. They will then create a username and password. Um, the username is pretty flexible. It just can't be a username that's already in use. Um, and when you create all of this um, with your password, you cannot use your name or your birthday or your social security number as part, part of your password. Another important thing when you're creating this is you can see down here where it says show password. This is one of these little things that we recommend people do is that anywhere where it gives you the opportunity opportunity to show what you're typing if it doesn't automatically show it you want to make sure that you can see it because we all make mistakes we, we we mistype something and then we can't figure out what we did because we didn't realize we mistyped something so when creating the password it's really a good idea to be sure that you're showing that and the password is much stricter uppercase lowercase number has to be at least eight characters okay so password can be put in confirmed and then next, the student is going to, or the borrower, or the parent's going to create um, or provide their contact information. So that's going to be pretty straightforward. And then they're going to put in their mobile phone number. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, the mobile phone number has to be one that's not already in use in the system. So a family, for example, couldn't share a cell phone number. Um, most times now, Families, individuals all have their own cell phone number, but, but not always. So if you've got a situation where it's a shared cell phone number, it cannot be used for any more than one individual. Now you don't have to provide a cell phone number. You have to provide either 
a cell phone number or an email, but you don't have to do both. We strongly recommend people do if they are able to, but it just has to be one or the other. Now, we do want people to be able to set up, um, if they're gonna use their mobile phone number, um, indicate that they want to be able to use it for account recovery. The easiest way for people to retrieve a username or to reset a password, especially if it's down the road and they don't remember anything related to it, is to be sure that via text, they can regain access to their account. Next, they're going to indicate their communication preferences. Um, so, you know, I don't see the federal student aid reaching out a lot to people. Uh, I've never had them text me except when I've needed to get a code, uh, but they do have you set up your um, desired communication preferences. Then come the challenge questions. And so there are four challenge questions that have to be answered. Um, despite the fact that it seems like they are, they are not case sensitive. Um, they do have to be between at least three and 50 characters, so you can kind of see the criteria there. Um, and this is another one of those cases where it's going to be so important that they show their answers um, so that they don't inadvertently, you know, mistype something. The other thing that's really important, and this where, is where our tracking sheet comes into play, is to write down the answers to those challenge questions. So in some cases, people might know that they answered it a certain way, but they can't remember the specifics. Like if the answer is Fruit Street, you know, where'd your kid go to elementary school? Mine went to Fruit Street. Did I write out Fruit Street and write out Street fully? Did I abbreviate it? Um, you know, did I put a space in between it? All of that stuff is gonna be really critical if they need to provide those challenge questions. So that's why it's a really good idea to write down the answer so that they not only remember the actual answer, but the structure of how they answered those questions. And then once they have selected those four challenge questions and answered them, they are going to confirm and verify their information. So they're gonna just make sure that everything looks okay. If they see something that's amiss, they can click on edit and they can correct it before moving on. And then we're just about at the end of setting up an FSA ID with the last critical step being to verify the mobile phone number and the email. Again, perfect world. They put in both the email and the mobile phone number um, so that they can verify both of those. If they do that, they can use either the mobile phone number or the email address or the username um, to get into um, the FAFSA or to do anything related to federal student aid. Um, so it not only helps with account recovery, but it gives you additional options when needing to use your FSA ID. So what happens is once you get to this screen, you would click on um, not verified, you click on it here, and it's going to send a text to your cell phone number. And so you're gonna get a six digit text that typically comes immediately and you're gonna enter that code here and then click on continue. Then you're gonna do the same thing with the email. You're gonna click here, it's gonna send um, an email to you with a six digit code in it. What we've been seeing this year is that there have been significant delays in the email coming through. The text is almost immediate, but the email is sometimes taking two and three minutes. Sometimes it seems like it's not coming through at all. Sometimes we're having to resend the code. Um, so patience is definitely required um, when you're trying to do this particular piece. Some nights it just seems to work better than others, um, but if you can just be patient, resend it, they typically have been coming through. Uh, worst case scenario, you back up, you take out the email address and you just continue um, without providing an email address. One thing I did neglect to mention related to email addresses is that for students who are in high school, for example, the preference is that they not use their high school email address. And that's because once they graduate, it's very likely that they will no longer have access to that email address. So it's really a good idea now for high school students and for anybody to have like a Gmail account that is just their account that's going to stay with them no matter where they are in school, uh, whether or not they're graduating, moving on to a different school, moving on to different jobs, having a Gmail or a Yahoo account or something like that is a really, really good idea um, so that you can ensure that you're going to have access to it um, down the road. And then this page is new um, this year is after you do those pieces, um, you will have the opportunity to get a backup code. So you will automatically see this backup code. Um, we did edit our tracking sheet to include a space to put the backup code on it. 
Um, in the backup code, the only time you're going to see it is on this screen here. Once you move away from this screen, you will never see that backup code again. The backup code is there um, in case someone is trying to log into a FAFSA, for example, and they have no way to get any of their other information. You know, they have an issue with their cell phone or their email. The backup code in combination with the challenge questions can be used. So we're hopeful that people don't need to use the backup code, but we want people to write it down just in case so they do have that available if worst case scenario arises. And we have some great resources. Um, the team has done a fabulous job of creating um, uh, videos. We have over 20 of them, um, but two of our favorites are create your FSA ID account or your federal student aid account. Um, and my personal favorite, what the heck is wrong with my FSA ID? So if people are trying to use their FSA ID and having issues with it, this video will highlight some of the common steps people can take to try to resolve those issues. So those can be found on our website. Um, Mary, I'm guessing we have a question that I should address. Yes, a couple of them, and I will apologize in advance because with the FSA ID changes this year, I may well be asking you more than I might otherwise. Um, oh, good. So the first one was um, about someone who had an FSA ID um, for a, as a parent mm -hmm. several years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, they had the PIN several years ago. Is there any complication or challenges that you're finding for parents who have an old older mm -hmm. FSA ID? Um, so what happened the first year, there was a link between the PIN and the FSA ID. That was right. only for one year. So even if people had a PIN years ago, don't worry, it doesn't make you getting an FSA ID any different than it would your kiddo who's you know just turning 18. Um, with families or parents who have an FSA ID from years ago, so maybe four or five years ago, they created one, um, what we want you to do is we want you to try to retrieve your username if you don't remember it. So as I go through the FAFSA, um, you're going to see a couple of places where you can do that. Wherever you need to use your FSA ID, including back a few screens ago, you always will have the option of I forgot my username or I forgot my password. And it's really easy with your username. So if you've verified your cell phone number, then it's as simple as once you click on I forgot my username, you'll put in your cell phone number and you'll put in your date of birth and they'll send you a text. And if you, once you put that text in, they, um, or once you put the number from the text in, they'll reveal your username to you. So that's why it's so critical. I mean, you just have to set up um, either an email or a username, an email or um, a, a cell phone number, excuse me. Uh, but that's why that's so important because if you've forgotten your information, you can really easily retrieve it if you have access to one of those two. Excellent. Thank you, Myla. And then the other one, with the mobility of cell phone numbers, I've had students unable to link their phone number to their ID because someone else has the number mm -hmm. and it's linked to another FSA ID. Do you have any advice for helping students through that? I had a student tell me they called and they were told that there wasn't anything that could be done. Last year, I had a student um, who was able to get their number disconnected from the other FSA ID so that they can then link it. Um, any advice on, you know, cell phone yeah. number changes that are being used yeah. by another FSA ID? Yeah. If you know who has that other number, like, let's just say I set up an account and I, I gave my phone to one of my kiddos or whatever, and I needed to disconnect it. Um, you can do that. So one of the things you can do with cell phone numbers and with email addresses is once you've established an FSA ID account, you can go back in and change those. So like, for example, if you have a student who uses their high school email address, that's not, I mean, I prefer they didn't, but the reality is what we just need them to do is to go in and replace that with a different email address when the time comes. So I'm guessing that when someone said they could disconnect the other cell phone number, maybe they knew who had that cell phone number. My experience to date is that if you don't know who had that cell phone number, it was a track phone or something like that, that there is no way that it can be disconnected. I've never seen that. So in those cases, what someone would do is they just would not be able to connect the cell phone. They wouldn't be able to link it to their FSA ID, but instead they would just use their email. So they would have their email as the option to do that. And everyone should be able to have an email that, that is not you know, has not been duplicated. So that's the, the backup plan. Great, that's all for now. Thank you, Myla. Okay, all righty. So now let's continue on with the FAFSA. 
Um, so I still have students go to the FAFSA by typing in fafsa.gov. Um, the reality is fafsa.gov is living on the federal student aid website. So if you look at the URL, you're gonna see that's where it actually resides. Um, but I still think it's it's easier and more direct just to go to fafsa.gov and it will, you know, it's a vanity URL. So it will take you right to this page. Um, that may change in the future, but that's how we've been doing it still. So what you're gonna do is the student's gonna click on start here when they're starting their FAFSA. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know why they have a start here and a login. Um, they go to the exact same place. So I've never quite been able to figure that out, um, but just click on start here and go from there. Now there are multiple ways that you can get into the FAFSA. Um, and what we recommend when possible is that the student be present um, and the student start the FAFSA using their FSA ID for a whole bunch of reasons. That is the preferred scenario. Um, in the past, we would say to parents, heck, I'm one of them, that I might do my students um, FAFSA, I might start my students FAFSA by indicating I'm the student because I have their FSA ID. I'm gonna show you in a moment why that's not gonna work as well this year. Um, but best case scenario, have the student there and have them click on, I am the student and I want to access my FAFSA form. If that's just not possible, then parents can indicate that they wanna start a FAFSA and instead of starting it with an FSA ID, they'll start it by providing demographic information, okay? So that's okay. I just, I think if you, you can, the best case is to have the student start it using their FSA ID. So if the student indicates that they um, are a student and they have their FSA ID, they will just click on login to continue. Or if they don't have an FSA ID yet, they can create one at this point. So there's gonna be multiple places where people who don't have an FSA ID can set one up when they're within the FAFSA. And you're gonna see here the other options to use those personal identifiers. Again, not my first choice and I'll explain why momentarily. So when you go to log in, um, the student is going to put in either their username or their email or their phone number if they're verified. So if someone is having trouble, they thought they used their, they knew what their username was, they can't remember it, but they connected their cell phone, then have them just use that in its place. So it gives you a lot more flexibility when you set up all of those options. Then they're gonna type in their password, again, click on show password. Here, if they can't remember, they can click on this, again, for forgot my username, you can let them know whether you want to get a text or an email, You'll put in that text um, number or that email address. You'll get a six digit code. You'll put it into the system. It will show you the username. Passwords, if people forget a password, they have to reset their password. You're never gonna be have your password revealed to you. Instead, you'll just have the opportunity to reset it. So assume that we've got that information. We're gonna log in and here's what's new this year. And this is why it is so critical that parents and students be together ideally, either in the same room or at least connected where they're on the phone together or can easily text back and forth together. Because what happens now is let's say the student is ready to do their FAFSA. They put in their FSA ID, their username and password, they are going to find that they have to do this two-step verification. This is new this year. So what they're going to do is they're going to, I think the easiest thing to do is to click on send code. This is to get a text message. I don't know why they are using SMS. No one calls it SMS. Um, I wish they just call it texting. Um, but if you click on this, they'll send a code to the individual's phone. They'll put in that six digit number and they can continue with the FAFSA. So back in the day, Last year, if I wanted to do Noah's FAFSA for him, and let's just say Noah's at work, no big deal. I've got his FSA ID, federal student aid wouldn't love that I did this, but I could go in, put his username and password in, and I could do start his FAFSA for him. Not recommending that, but I could do that. Now what's happening is if I have his username and password, I can put it in, but I've got to be sure that I can reach him or he can get back to me so that he can tell me what, you know, if I select the texting option, he can give me that six digit code. If I can't reach him, I can't get beyond this point. So again, it's really, we've tried to incorporate it into all of our materials, the need for students and parents to be in the same room, same place, or at least connected to each other um, is going to make completion of this process much easier um, than, you know, in the past, they might not have had to worry so much about that. 
So then what they're going to do is they're going to start their FAFSA. Now, you've heard me mention a few times that I prefer that people get their FSA ID ahead of time and start their FAFSA with their FSA ID. And the reason is, is if the student got their FSA ID ahead of time, say two to three days before, um, it will have already gone to Social Security Administration to try to do the match. And if we come here and we see that it's matched, that's great. That means we know that the students got their right name, their correct um, birth date, and their correct social security number. So the FSA ID, keep in mind in a moment, is going to pre-fill a lot of that information. So I feel really confident when I'm starting a FAFSA with a student and I see that green match that I know that that set of information is going to be correct. If I saw that as a yellow, it would mean that they had just done it. There hadn't been time for the match. So there was no indication that there's anything wrong with it, but we just don't know for sure. So you go ahead and you proceed. If you see this in red saying not matched, stop. Don't do anything because it means that there is an issue or don't do anything with the FAFSA. It means there's an issue with the information they provided on their FSA ID. So what they want to do is go and, and deal with that first. They, they want to go back to studentaid.gov, log in with their username and password, double check their name, double check their social security number, uh, double check their birthday. I had someone one year, what they had done is they couldn't figure out what was up with their FSA ID. It wasn't matching. They put their first name in their last name and their last name in their first name line. Um, so it can be something as simple as that, but you want to get those issues resolved before you proceed with the FAFSA because you don't want the FAFSA with the wrong information. Things can always be fixed, but fixing a social security number or a name are much harder, easier to avoid that problem instead. All right, so that's why I want people um, to get their FSA IDs ahead of time. And then when they're in here, they're going to select the correct year of the FAFSA. So at this point, most of the FAFSAs that we're doing are the 23-24 FAFSA, which are going to cover the 23-24 academic year. So high school seniors, for example, um, are applying now for financial aid that they're going to receive next year. But for those of you, I know we've got some financial aid people and people who've worked for students with students for a long time. We still have people currently enrolled who haven't done their FAFSA for this year yet. Um, so the 22-23 FAFSA is still available as well. And so next, what the student is going to do is they're going to set up a save key. And what a save key is, is it's just a temporary password. So the save key is created, doesn't need to be super secure. Um, it's just a temporary password that let's just say the student doesn't finish off their FAFSA all in one sitting. Let's say they start it and then their parent's going to come back in later and finish it off or they just need to go get a piece of information that they don't have or they just get a phone call and they just need to leave right now. All of those times um, what's going to happen is they will then come back to FAFSA.gov, they'll log back in, it will ask for their save key and they will just put that save key in and it will let them pick up right where they left off. So it's just a temporary password. Once the FAFSA is submitted, that save key is gone. Okay, just a temporary password. And Mary, I will, I will stop in just a moment, okay? Uh, the next thing I want to show you is that the FAFSA, because I'm not showing you absolutely every screen, just most of them. The FAFSA has seven sections, so you can kind of track your progress as you go. You cannot skip over a section um, because of the way the skip logic works. You need to do things in sequence, although you can back up at any point in time. So once you've gone all the way through, you could jump back to the school section, for example. The whole first half of the FAFSA is all about the student. So again, best case scenario, we have the student sitting there, the student starts their FAFSA with their FSA ID. And assuming that they do that, the FSA ID information is gonna pull over. It's gonna pre-fill their social, which again, if it's matched, then we know it's correct. It's gonna pre-fill their social, their name, their date of birth, and a lot of that critical information that was already provided when they created their FSA ID. So that's, that's, that's the best case scenario. Um, if they have any questions all through the FAFSA, there's this little question mark they can click on that will provide answers to the question. Um, additionally, we wanna be sure that people use the continue and previous buttons. Don't use the browser arrows. That will mess things up and just make it a little bit harder um, to progress through the FAFSA. So please be sure to use those. The student is then going to provide their email and phone number and their address. Again, much of it's going to come over from their FSA ID, making these screens really easy to complete. 
um, the student is then going to provide um, confirmation of their residency. If they've indicated that they're a Maine resident, it's going to ask them if they've lived in Maine for at least five years. If they indicated they're from New Hampshire, it's going to say, have you lived in New Hampshire for at least five years? So the student's going to answer that. And then the student is going to answer the question related to citizenship. <clears throat> so many of our students are US citizens, so they're just going to say yes. Um, but you're going to notice that there's a couple of other options. <clears throat> And I know you can't probably read these. I know I can't even with my glasses. Um, but what they are is, yes, I'm a US citizen. Um, no, I'm not a US citizen, but I'm an eligible non-citizen. Or no, I am not a citizen or an eligible non-citizen. So when you click on the question mark here, you're going to see this um, screen here come up. And it's going to give you an indication of who's considered to be an eligible non-citizen. Um, so you're going to find that there are going to be students who definitely are eligible for federal financial aid, even though they are not U.S. citizens. So if that's the case, they're going to indicate I'm an eligible non-citizen, and then they will provide um, their A number and enter that. That's The FAFSA is cool in the sense that there's the skip logic, as I mentioned, built in. And so it figures out what questions you need to answer. And if there are additional questions or fewer questions based on your circumstances, um, then you only see what you need to. So an A number, a place to put in that A number would come up if the student indicated they were an eligible non-citizen. If they are not a citizen and they're not an eligible non-citizen, then you know they probably don't need to go ahead and fill out the FAFSA if they're going to school in, in Maine. Um, we're not going to consider them, unfortunately, even for state um, state grant. Uh, but there are some schools that will consider them for their aid. So, um, and again, not so much here in Maine, but out of state. So if you're working with a student, you know, have them contact their school if they're not an eligible citizen um, or an eligible non-citizen. If they're not either of those things, have them contact their school and see if it's worth it for them to go ahead and fill out a FAFSA. The student's then going to provide their driver's license number. Now, this is one of those things where it's great if they have it, and we want them to put it in if they have a have a license. If they don't have it, that's not a big deal. If they have a license, but they don't have it on them, um, it's one of those things if they need to run to their bedroom and get it, do that. But if I'm in a FAFSA event, I'm not going to have someone not submit their FAFSA because this piece is missing. They can come back in and add it later. Mary, I'm going to pause for a second here before I get into the education pieces um, and see if there was something you need me to address. Yeah, just two quick questions, which I can answer, but I think for the group, if our student is a second year student and has a FAFSA ID already, do they just log in with the existing ID? Yes. Yeah. And actually they should have a chance also to do a renewal, which is gonna make it easier. Yeah. And then does the two-step verification start November 1st or right away um, after October 1st? Now that it's so, after October 1st. Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. So it was in July that two-step verification started being required. So anyone who created an FSA ID, I think it was July 11th or so, anyone after that automatically is having to do the two-step verification. There's people like Mary and I who have FSA IDs. I went in and I set up two-step verification just because I wanted to see how it worked. Mary, I don't think you've done that yet, right? Mm -mm, no. So Mary and everyone else out there who already had an FSA ID before July 11th, if they've done nothing, they don't need to do two-step verification. So your sophomores right now probably don't need to do two-step verification. What's coming though in November is there's going to be a rolling of requirement that we establish two-step verification. So at some point, the next time people log in, they're probably gonna have to set that up. So what I would anticipate is that two or three months from now, everyone's going to have to do it. But absolutely everyone has to do it now who created an FSA ID after July 11th or so. Great. And then the last question that just came in, is there a way to flag a student who was not a Maine resident in the prior year? We had a student who said they were a Maine resident, but they really came to Maine for school. There's no way that I know that we're going to catch that. You know, I think we just, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I think the school is going to have to verify that. I would think the school might know that because they might know where the student went to high school and where they were from originally, and maybe they're tracking that, but I don't, on the FAFSA, the student says their main resident. I mean, we, we don't have a way to not know that. Yeah. No, that's not the case. And then um, 
what does a parent do when trying to receive, retrieve their FSA ID if they can't remember what email or phone they used when they created an FSA ID for an older child in the past? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this happens. So the the last resort. So what I would say, first of all, is call one of us, okay? Because you'd be surprised what we have figured out sometimes in the way. I feel like, um, you know, this is, I, I think I wanted to be a detective in my, my other life. Um, so call us and see if we can help. If we can't, and there have been a handful of times where what we've had to do is just route people to federal student aid, which we don't like to do, we don't have to. But worst case scenario, what you can do is if you call federal student aid, um, they can see that one exists. They'll ask you for your identifying information name, birthday, social security number, and they can see that an FSA ID exists, they will have you, they will send you an email that you will respond to, um, or the student or parent will respond to, um, providing some documentation, typically a license or some legal identification. And then once they receive that, then they will send you your um, username and they will allow you to reset your password, at which point you can then use your FSA ID again. And the whole process, they say, takes about seven days or so. Um, so there is a way to do that um, as a last resort, call federal student aid and they will, they will get people situated, okay? But you can't do it on someone's behalf. They have to do it themselves. So that's a real bugger and why, you know, we really, really want people to write information down. And it gets to the point that, you know, if, you, if you're going to be someone who's going to be moving a lot and changing email addresses and changing phone numbers, you know, you need to go into your federal student aid account and update those things as you go. It's really easy to do, but you've got to do it. And again, that's another reason for creating that Gmail account or that Yahoo account that you're going to have forever um, and not change um, so that you have access to that. But call federal student aid if, if all else fails. Great. That's it, Myla. Thank okay. you. And everyone, I know I'm going to go over, so I'm just going to be honest with you about that. I, I Every year I mean to make this one an hour and a half, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plow through as much as we can get through. I will continue until the end of the presentation. I know some of you will have to drop off um, when we're done the hour, but know that this is being recorded and you'll get a link to the recording. So if you want to watch the rest of it, um, you can, um, but I'm, I already talk fast. So I'm just trying to remind myself, I'm just going to, if I go over a little bit, you need to leave. That's fine. I apologize, but it is being recorded. All right. So now what the student is going to be doing is providing information about their education. Um, so they are going to indicate um, what their high school completion status will be as of the 23-24 school year um, when they begin the year. So most students are going to be that they have a high school diploma, um, but another option is that they're homeschooled or another option is they have gotten their GED or their high set. They're going to indicate, um, you know, what type of program they're going to be in, an associate's or a bachelor's or whatever might be the case, um, whether or not they have a bachelor's degree already, because that impacts aid eligibility, um, what level of school they're going to be in when they start the next year. So if you have a high school senior, you're going to indicate never attended college first year, that's even if they have credit. So we have a lot of students who are taking some college credits while they're in high school, but for the purposes of this question, they wanna answer never attended college first year. And that's because they've never attended college and been eligible for federal financial aid. So please have them answer that that way. Um, and then we always want students to say they wanna be considered for work study. Um, they can decline it if they don't want it down the road, but we want them to be offered it if they are eligible. Um, here, students are going to indicate whether or not they were a foster youth or ever in foster care. This question, foster care question comes up twice. This one is solely because if the student says yes, federal student aid is going to send them some additional information on resources that might be available to them because they've been in foster care. I'll talk in a moment about why, what the other foster care question gets to. And then have the student provide the highest level of education for their biological parents. Um, this is not something we use a lot here in Maine, um, don't use it for any programs that I'm aware of, but sometimes people identify students as being first gen based on this question. There is an I don't know um, response as well. Students going to list their high school. Now they will see this assuming that they um, said that they have a, a high school diploma. Um, if they are homeschooled, they won't see this question at all because they didn't attend a high school. Um, so the student is going to put in um, their state and city or state and high school name or whichever combination works for them um, so that it, they can click on search and then it will come up and they will just say, okay, that's the right one. And then they will continue. 
now we're actually in the college search section. So the college search section is where the student is going to list all of the schools that they want to receive this FAFSA data. Um, schools will automatically be sent this data if they are listed here. Students can list up to 10 schools they have to list at least one. So if I've got a student who really isn't sure what their plans are next year, they don't even know where they want to apply, they just need to put at least one school um, in the school section here. They can come back later and add additional schools, okay? So they're gonna go ahead and they're going to put in their state. Um, so for example, if they were applying to a bunch of Maine schools, they could just click on Maine and it would list all of the schools in Maine. A lot of times you wanna get a little bit more specific. So what I did here is I did Maine, but then I added in Bangor, and I can see the three schools that exist here in Bangor. So I click on whichever school was appropriate, um, and then the next thing I'm going to see is I'm going to see I need to indicate my housing plans. So students are either going to indicate that they plan to be on campus, off campus, or living with parents. So if students are in doubt about that, um, and there's on-campus housing, that's what I would recommend that they answer. They can follow up with the school and change the answer to that question later if needed. So now we are getting to the questions in the dependency section. So we're already into section three. Um, these questions, again, determine whether a student is going to be independent or dependent. And that get ready checklist that I'm going to send you will have those questions, um, all of those questions. We've actually already answered a couple of them. Um, we've already answered questions about the student's age. Um, we've already answered questions about whether the student is in graduate school, for example. Uh, but now we're going to continue with a few more. And so one of those is the student married. So if the student is married, they are automatically considered to be independent. Most of our high school students um, and most of our undergrads, though certainly not all, are probably still going to be single. So they are not going to be considered independent um, based on their marital status. Um, some other questions that are related to dependency status um, will be, does the student have any dependent children of their own? So if I have a student that let's say is 20, they don't meet any of the other dependency criteria to be considered independent, except that they have a child. If they have a child and they provide more than half support for that child, then they can answer yes to that question. Now, let's just say, again, they're a 20-year-old female. Um, she's living with her parents. Her parents are actually providing the housing, the food, and the vast majority of expenses. She would not be able to answer yes to the question that she's providing more than half support. Okay, so just make sure that the student, when they're answering this question, thinks about, am I or am I not providing half support for my child? If they are providing support because they get TANF or SNAP or a housing subsidy or things like that, they can count that as them, they, the student providing that support. So if there are questions about that, let me know. Sometimes those questions come up. If a student is pregnant, she can also indicate yes to this, this answer. The student might have other dependents that would be um, someone for whom they provide at least half support. Um, sometimes it might be a student, again, let's just say they're 20, 21, they're not independent for any other reason, but they have a younger sibling living with them and they are working and providing more than half support to that younger sibling. Or maybe I had a student one time who her mother lived with her and her mother got a little bit of social security, but the reality was the student, in addition to going to school full-time, was trying to work full-time and she was actually providing half support for her mother. So she was able to answer yes to that question. So answering yes to these questions, um, either of these automatically makes the student independent. And then we have all but one of the remaining um, dependency questions. So if someone is in on active duty um, in the US military for purposes other than training. So if you're in the National Guard and you're only doing training, this does not qualify. But anyone who's on active duty, either because it's active duty military or they're in the National Guard and they were called up on active duty, um, they could answer yes to this. If they're a veteran of the armed forces, they could say yes to this. Um, if at any time since the child or the student turned 13, their parents were deceased, both parents, um, or they were in foster care or a dependent or ward of the court, they would be considered independent. So that's the other foster care question. If you have a student that you're working with that was in foster care at any point in time from the age of 13 on, even if they are no longer in foster care, they can answer yes to this question. 
So for example, imagine a student who was in foster care till the age of 15. At the age of 15, they were adopted. They can still answer yes to this question and they would be considered independent. The next question is, um, as determined by a court in your state of legal residence, are you or were you an emancipated minor? So any students who are an emancipated minor um, or were, you know, before they turned 18, they would answer yes to this question. And then last but not least, um, does someone other than your parent or your step parent, uh, meaning your biological or adoptive parent, have legal guardianship of you as determined by a court in your state of legal residence? So we see a lot of times where there are grandparents or maybe other family members who have legal guardianship of the child. So the parents at some point have relinquished their rights and someone else has taken legal guardianship of that student. If that's the case, the student answers yes to this question. And that means they are considered independent, meaning that no parent information is required on the FAFSA. So I know we all know people out there who are grandparents who have legal guardianship of grandchildren. In that scenario, the student is independent and no parent information or grandparent information would be required on the FAFSA. Grandparents never fill out the FAFSA on behalf of a parent unless they've adopted the student. That's the only time that a grandparent would provide parent information on the FAFSA is if they've adopted the student and that's because they have become their legal parent, okay? Otherwise, never gonna have grandparent information. And we'll talk about in a moment what happens if they don't have legal guardianship, okay? So let's just say all of those are no. Student cannot answer yes to any of those. The last one is gonna be the homeless question. Um, did the student uh, at any time on or after July 1st find that they were homeless or were self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? And if the answer to that um, is yes, we're gonna talk about that in a moment, but let's assume for the moment that the answer to this question is no. And just one minor point of clarification, and this definition doesn't, doesn't say this specifically, but the student does need to be unaccompanied. So let's just say I have a student and the family is in a situation where the family is living in a homeless shelter, okay? So the family is indeed homeless, but the student is in the shelter with their parent they would not be able to answer yes to this question because they also need to be unaccompanied. If they're accompanied by their parent, um, they, they cannot answer yes. They would still need to indicate that yes, um, you know, that they might indeed be homeless, but they would answer no to this question and their parents would provide parent information on the FAFSA. Probably gonna be a zero EFC. All right, so I'm gonna continue on as if no, and we'll address homelessness a little bit in a moment. So the student in this situation would be considered dependent. It would default to this and say that they will provide information about their parents. At the end, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what happens if they can't. So when we're talking about parents providing information on the FAFSA, we first need to determine who the parents are for the purposes of the FAFSA. If a student's parents live together, regardless of whether they're married or not, and we're talking about the biological or adoptive parents, if they um, live together, married or not, the student is going to provide information about both of those parents. Here, when you're in a live FAFSA, you could click on this and you could see it defined a little bit more detail. If parents are divorced or separated, um, the student typically would live with one parent more than the other. The parent that they lived with most over the last 12 months is going to be the parent um, who would provide financial information on the FAFSA. Believe it or not, the other parent would not provide any information. If I'm the student, my parents are divorced, I live with my dad 60% of the time. I live with my mom 40% of the time. Dad's information is required on the FAFSA. Mom's is not. Has nothing to do with who claims the student on the tax return or anything like that this year. There are changes coming to the definition of the parent um, next year, um, assuming the changes go into effect next year, um, that will be who provides the most financial support. But for this year, it continues to be who did the student live with most during the last 12 months. They do have, you know, you could have lived with parents equally. The reality is the student just needs to live with one parent more than the other. Wait another day, spend an extra day with one of their parents and then make it nice and, and clear cut. So then um, that parent is going to list their marital status and note that it's marital status as of today. And people can get really frustrated about this one because let's just say back to my scenario a moment ago, I live with dad 60% of the time and mom 40. So mom's information is not needed. It's gonna be dad's information, but dad's remarried. 
if dad is remarried, then his spouse's information, my step-parent's information, would have to be provided on the FAFSA, okay? So it's the parent you've identified as having to complete the FAFSA. What is that parent's marital status as of today? And then you put in the date. So assuming that it's two parents, you're first gonna put the information in about the first parent, and then you're gonna put information in about the second parent. If you only had one parent because the student's um, parent is divorced or separated or never married, um, it will, you'll indicate whether it's mom or dad, and then you'll only have one parent's information that you would need to put into the FAFSA. FAFSA is smart like that, knows how many parents it needs. You're gonna put the parent's state of legal residence, um, and then you are going to fill out the household size. So on this screen here, the FAFSA has already assumed that the student is being counted and the parents are being counted, whether it's one parent or two. So it's already knowing that. But what it wants to know in addition is how many dependent children there are. So do your parents have other dependent children? And here are the definitions. Basically, do they provide more than half support or would the student um, that's the dependent potentially, if they filed financial aid, would they be considered dependent? In any of those cases, you would add them here. And then if there are other dependents who live in the house that provide um, are provided more than half support by the parents and meet this definition, um, then they would indicate that there as well. So then you're gonna continue on. Again, it's automatically counted the student and the parents, and then it's added in any other people that we provided on the last screen. And I know those don't match. On the last screen, it would have been four. The screen, it's five. We get the screenshots that they send us. <laughs> um, and then you are going to indicate how many of the dependents, so that you, the student, the two others, are in college currently. And basically, as we're probably all familiar with, it then takes the EFC and it divides the parent EFC by the number in college. This is another one of those things that assuming those changes go through next year will no longer happen. There will be no division of the parent EFC. So then we're gonna have the parent fill out their filing status um, because we're using 2021 information for the 23-24 FAFSA. That's why we call it prior prior year in financial aid world is because the taxes are from two years prior. So take the first year of the FAFSA, 23-24. So for the 23-24 FAFSA, we're using 21 income. So most people have filed, they, most people have now filed 1040 um, and they're gonna indicate what type of filing status. Let's say for the moment, it's a married joint return. Um, it says, hey, you know, it looks like you can use the IRS data retrieval tool. Would you like to? And the answer we hope is always yes, please use that tool. It's gonna to make it quicker and it's gonna make it easier. So to use that tool, what the parent has to do, this is the first time a parent needs their FSA ID, is they have to enter their FSA ID because that's how they're going to connect um, to the IRS. So whichever parent can do it, um, if my husband and I were listed, you know, I typically was the one that would have, I would have clicked on myself and I would have entered my FSA ID, my username and password or my email and my password or my mobile phone number and password if, if they had been verified. If I get to this point and I haven't created an FSA ID yet, I can do it now. If I think I have an FSA ID, but I can't remember what it is, I can click on this and I can try to retrieve my username. I've got my username, but I can't remember my password. I can click on this and they will send me, you know, if I indicate that I have my phone connected um, to my FSA ID, they can send me a text and I can reset my password. All of that's available um, in this particular screen. So then they're gonna link to the IRS. They're going to have some of this information pre-filled, but they do need to put in their address this is going to change next year as well. It's going to be a direct link, supposedly. But for now, they need to provide um, their address. And so it needs to match exactly what was on their tax return. Hopefully, it finds their taxes. It will show you a screen like this when it does. It's going to show you everything that it's going to pull over. It's going to pull over all of these categories, even if they are zeros. And you will indicate that you, you want to transfer it. So you'll click on this box and click Transfer Now. And then lo and behold, the information is going to transfer over. You won't actually see what the numbers are. It will just say transferred from the IRS. Now, people get confused sometimes when we get to this screen because they've used the IRS data retrieval tool and they're like, why, why am I having to provide um, additional information? I use the tool. Well, if you think about a tax return for joint tax filers, when I file a tax return, my husband and my, um, we have our wages combined on our tax return. The wages are in one line. 
for tax purposes, that's fine. But for financial aid purposes, currently, they need the, the income divided between the two parents. And it's because there's an allowance behind the scenes, okay? So what families wanna do is they just wanna pull out their W-2s, see what's on line one um, of their W-2 or in that box, the wages box, or if they're self-employed, probably where they're gonna find that is on schedule one, lines three or six, um, and box 14 if they have a Schedule K. So that's where people can find that information. Individuals are going to read through these questions and see if any of them are applicable. If they use the IRS data retrieval, it was gonna fill out many of these questions for them and say it's been transferred from the IRS. Um, the parents are going to provide additional financial information. For example, if a parent is paying child support, they're gonna enter that here because what that's gonna do behind the scenes is the formula is gonna recognize that there's a portion of their income that is not available to help them pay for college for this student because they're paying child support somewhere else. So if they have this, I mean, they wanna put that in because it's actually gonna be beneficial um, to them in terms of their financial aid eligibility. So read through those questions. And then parents will also enter their untaxed income. Um, so they might be receiving child support, in which case they're going to enter that. One of the most common ones is a lot of people contribute to a retirement plan. And when they contribute to that retirement plan, it's pre-tax. So it's not listed on a tax return. What they have to do is look at their W-2s. and it, it has instructions right here. So on a W-2 um, form on boxes 12A through 12D, that's where they're going to see what they would have contributed to a retirement plan. It could be in any of those boxes, but they only want codes D, E, F, G, H, and S. For example, if you ever noticed, if you look at your W-2, um, you might have um, DD, and that's the amount your employer contributes towards your health insurance, which is a crazy number in many cases. So that's what that is. So they are only going to list these other ones because employer contributions for anything do not get counted um, in this section. Now, parent assets, um, parent assets questions. Um, there used to be a parent asset allowance. Um, it is gonna ask them if they have any assets and if they exceed a certain dollar amount, that dollar amount for everyone is zero this year. There is no asset protection allowance this year. Um, so basically all parents, um, except what I'm gonna talk about in a moment, will provide their assets. Um, they will list the balance of their current checking savings um, and cash or their um, investments or their um, business. Now, I think what's as important to mention, what they do have to include is what they don't have to include. So in filing a FAFSA, families do not provide the value of their primary residence. The primary residence is completely excluded from the FAFSA. Additionally, um, any retirement accounts that people have setting, set aside waiting for them to retire, that's going to be excluded from the FAFSA, okay? So the value of a retirement plan is excluded. Now, I know I just talked about contributing to retirement plan, but that's only because that was income in 2021. So that does have to be provided, but the value of the retirement plan is excluded. Additionally, if families have a small family-owned business with fewer than 100 full-time employees, that is also excluded from the FAFSA for this year. That's another change that's coming for next year, okay? So cash savings checking, non-retirement investments, second properties, 529 plans. Those are things that are going to be listed here. If families have a 529 plan like a NextGen account, it's always going to be listed as a parent asset um, unless it is owned by someone other than the parent or the student, okay? So it's a parent asset if the parent owns it and the student's a beneficiary. If the student owns the account because they can once they're 18, it's still going to show as a parent asset. If it's grandmother or grandfather that own it, you don't have to put it on here at all. Now, I do want to mention that the FAFSA also has what's called some simplified pathways um, that make it a whole lot easier um, to finish the FAFSA and get it done. So two of the pathways are available based on income. The first is, is that if, if a family earns less than $50,000, if they have an adjusted gross income of less than $50,000, and they can answer one yes to any of three questions, they don't have to provide any asset information. So if they either didn't have to file a Schedule 1 or they did file a Schedule 1, but only for the reasons list, listed here, um, then they would meet this criteria. But let's say they don't know. 
or they didn't meet that criteria. Then they are asked, are you a dislocated worker? If you are a dislocated worker, you'd meet that criteria of being able to skip your assets, but maybe you don't know, or maybe you're not a dislocated worker. So then you go to the third criteria, which is, did you receive any of these federally uh, means tested programs? So basically what that means, if I have a family that's earning under $50,000 per year, and the student is getting main care or Medicaid, but main care in this case, um, um, SNAP, TANF, free and reduced lunch, which got to be honest, this one's going away because everyone's getting free and reduced lunch, but it's on there for now, um, or SNAP or WIC, excuse me, if they're receiving any of those benefits, this is the third criteria that would get them that simplified pathway. So if they can answer yes to any one of those, no schedule one or only for the reasons listed, dislocated worker, or receiving any of these means tested program, meaning anyone in their house is receiving these, then they would see this, which means that they can skip assets. They can skip all the parent assets and they're gonna be able to skip the student assets when it comes to that point, okay? So that's one of the simplified pathways. Now, if you had someone whose income was less than 29,000, so in between, you know, um, so we have the people who are over 29, but less than 50, they don't have to provide their assets. But if we have someone who has income less than 29,000 and can answer yes to one of those criteria, don't have to file a schedule one or only for the reasons listed, um, or a dislocated worker or received any of these fee, um, means tested programs, then they are going to see this, which says, do you want to skip the remaining questions about your mother's income and assets or your parents' income and assets? That means that this student is automatically going to be considered an auto zero. They're going to have a zero EFC and they don't have to answer any parent asset questions. They don't have to answer any student income questions, and they don't have to answer any student asset questions. So if you're sitting with a student and you go through this and you might not know what the income was because it was transferred from the IRS, but you're realizing, oh my gosh, we're done. That's because of the income is allowing them to use one of those simplified pathways. So the student would then provide their financial information looks very much like the parent section, again, unless um, they met that auto zero criteria, and then they would not have to provide any student financial information as well. I know we are at one o'clock, two o'clock, excuse me. Um, I'm going to keep going. I know some of you might need to leave me. It's going to be recorded. I'll send you the recording. You can listen to the last. I apologize. Next year, someone remind me to make this an hour and a half. Um, Mary, I'll just do one quick section, and then I'll see what questions we have. Yep. So then they're not quite done. Um, they're going to see your FAFSA summary. Um, it's many, many, it's all the questions, <laughs> but if they see one that they um, answered wrong, they can just click on it and they can fix it. Um, and then what they're going to see, and this is new this year, is there's this demographic question um, or survey. You might notice that one of the questions that was not asked this year was, are you male or female? Um, that's now being asked in this survey at the end, which they don't have to answer the individual questions. They have to finish this section, but for all of them, they can decline to answer. So are you, what's your gender? Are you transgender? Um, what's your ethnicity? And then what is your race? Okay, demographic for, the, for this year, it is only information that the federal student aid um, system is going to receive. My understanding is schools are not even going to receive this information. And then the student's just gonna see the terms and conditions. Um, they'll click on the box and continue if they started their FAFSA using their FSA ID. Um, they've already entered their FSA ID, so they've consigned it at that point. They're all good to go. Then parents will need to sign the FSA with their FSA ID. It can be either parent. So, you know, I, I always made myself parent too. Doesn't matter which you do. Doesn't matter what your tax return is. Um, but I just always made myself parent too. Um, and so I would then click on here um, and I would provide my FSA ID um, unless I hadn't, I'd already used it. If I used it to do the transfer, I shouldn't have to enter it again. Again, if someone gets to this point, they haven't created an FSA ID, they can create one now. They've forgotten it, they can retrieve it. Same with their password. There is an option to sign the FAFSA in other ways, one of which is a paper um, signature page. Um, again, that potentially is gonna be very limited for next year, but um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, I don't recommend this unless there's no other option. It's better to resolve the issues with an FSA ID um, than it is to do the signature page. But again, if you have questions about any of this, please let us know. 
Then they'll get the confirmation page that lets them know that they are all done. This is when we high five everyone. Um, and then if they were to go back into their FAFSA once it's processed, they would see that it's been processed. They could add schools if they wanted to. They could make corrections. You don't update the FAFSA, but they could correct the FAFSA or they could view their student aid report. Okay. Woo, it's a lot. Sorry. Mary, questions before we finish off the last little section? Sure. Um, the first one, I, I'm fine, but I think for the group, and then I get turned around in my head on the tax year. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is an untaxed, so I'm going to ask it just in case because I don't mm -hmm. want to be wrong. If I receive child support in the tax year of 2021, mm -hmm. but I'm not currently receiving any, does that get listed? Yes, yes. Anything for 2021 that's an income question, you have to answer for 2021. Then what you would do is you would follow up with the school. So let's just say someone was getting significant child support and it was really impacting the EFC. They'd want to follow up with the school and let the school know that that child support stopped. Child support's also going to be handled differently next year. So we'll get to that, um, but that, that is changing as well. Uh, the next question, all students at this school um, get free and reduced lunch, no matter the income. Do they answer yes to it? I would, yes, because they are getting it. And that's why they're going to take that question off. <laughs> uh, but for now, it's still on there. So yes, if they're getting free and reduced lunch, we don't know if they're getting it because of the means test or not. So I would say yes. Keep in mind, they've still got to have a relatively low income in order to get this pathway. But yeah, they legitimately can answer that question yes right now. What if parents do not file taxes or cannot find their W-2 forms? Okay. Parents that don't file taxes, no big deal. There are plenty of parents out there who don't. Um, where we had the question that said, I've, um, I've completed my taxes, there is an option that says, I do not file taxes. Um, so families who don't file taxes um, can go ahead and they will just enter zero if their income is zero. Um, that's fine. That's no problem. I do want to just mention that people who get Social Security, that Social Security is excluded from the FAFSA. So it is possible for someone to file a FAFSA with no income and no benefits at all um, because they're excluding their Social Security and that's all they have. Um, the second part to that was they can't find their W-2s. The W-2s, you know, often they're attached to a tax return. They're critical for two reasons. Um, one is that that's how you separate out your wages if you are filing man married joint. Now that you can probably figure out, I have a ballpark idea of what my wages are versus my husband. So you can not find your W-2s and you can get a close estimate. I think you can, you can go with that. Um, the challenge is you do need to be sure whether or not you contribute to a retirement plan. Um, so if you can't find your W-2s, then check your pay stubs and see what you contributed to your retirement plan. That'd be my recommendation. They could probably also ask their employer if they're still employed, you know, yeah, if their oh, HR yeah. department has that information. Yes, exactly, um, exactly. The last uh, question for now, alimony received is on my W-2 for 2021, so I don't need to list that as additional income, right? If it's in the adjusted gross income, then no, it doesn't get listed separately. So that's the way if someone pulls out their tax return and they look at their tax return and I, you know, this is how sad it is. I keep my tax return right here beside me so I can reference it easily. I'm such a geek, but your adjusted gross income is on line 11. If everything above, if there's anything above line 11, you know, it's already incorporated in the AGI. So it doesn't need to be listed separately. Great. That's all Myla. Thank you. Okay, so the last section, thank you for your patience, everybody. The last section, I'm just gonna talk about those students for whom this is not quite as easy and they have unusual circumstances, but we're gonna zip through it pretty darn quickly. So I wanna talk about those students who are homeless. So when we were filling it out initially, we said that the student was not homeless, but let's imagine now that the student is homeless or is at risk of being homeless. So this is a student who might still be in high school. This might be a college student. Um, this is anyone who on or after July 21 of 2022 for this FAFSA um, was homeless or at risk. Then what they're going to see is they're going to see a series of questions. Um, they're going to be asked, can anyone document that? So for high school seniors, usually this is pretty straightforward. If their high school is considering them homeless, they would just say yes to this homeless question they would click continue. They would be told that they're gonna be considered independent. 
and then they would just finish off their FAFSA. Um, they would probably have to still provide their student income, um, but no, no parent information, okay? So if that can be documented, and again, the other places that could document it um, are by uh, emergency shelter or transitional housing program or runaway or homeless youth center, um, any of those people who can verify that, that's a nice, straightforward, um, say yes to those. They're going to be considered independent. The school may still want to see that documentation, um, but they're going to go through the FAFSA and they're going to get um, a valid um, FAFSA, a valid EFC, we would believe. Let's just say the student can't. So imagine a student who is in high school and they file the FAFSA and they're homeless and their school can verify that they're homeless. Um, so they go to college, they're living on campus, um, they, they're getting their financial aid, so they're able to afford to live on campus, they're staying there for break housing, um, they go to fill out their FAFSA next year, whatever situation existed continues to exist, but there's no one to document it, right? Who's going to document that they're homeless now? Their school, their high school can't do that anymore. They're not in one of these other shelters or centers where someone can verify this. So in that scenario, the student can indicate none of the above. So yes, I am in that situation, but no one, no one can verify that, okay? So they would click continue. Their FAFSA would be submitted. It's gonna just double check that they understand, and this is where the unaccompanied piece comes in, that they do indeed meet this criteria. And then if they click continue, it's gonna just remind them that, hey, if you click continue here, um, you know, none of your information, um, excuse me, your information is going to be sent to the federal government, but your FAFSA isn't going to be considered valid. It's not going to be a FAFSA that you can be awarded a Pell Grant on. No EFC is going to be calculated. Instead, what that student is going to need to do, as it says here, is to follow up with the financial aid administrator. So what the financial aid administrator will do is talk with the student get a sense of their under, you know, what their situation is. If they can get documentation from somewhere else that they're homeless or, or, you know, in the situation, great. But to be honest with you, a financial aid person can document it based solely on the conversation, which is so uncomfortable for financial aid people who are used to needing all this documentation. But a conversation alone is sufficient to document that. So once the financial aid person talks with the student, then they can indicate that, yep, they are considered to be homeless, and then their FAFSA will be considered valid, and they can get the financial aid that they are um, eligible for, okay? So if you have any questions or homeless students that you're working with, if we can help in any way, please let us know. I have more resources related to that, okay? Imagine a student who is not homeless. That's not their situation. Um, they just have a situation where it's really complicated. So either um, maybe a parent is incarcerated, maybe one parent's incarcerated, maybe the other has passed away. Maybe there are drug abuse issues. Uh, maybe the reason that a student lives with a grandparent is because the family situation was not healthy, was psychologically you know, damaging or, or, or physically damaging, um, dangerous, whatever might be the case. In those circumstances, the student may get to this point where it says, you know, I couldn't say yes to any of the dependency criteria, but the reality is, is I can't get my parents' information. Either I can't find them um, or whatever might be the case. So they can indicate also that they are unable to provide parent information. They see the same thing the homeless students did, which is basically you can submit a FAFSA, but you got to follow up with your school. They're going to follow up with their school. Um, they're first going to, though, make sure that they do meet this criteria. Um, so, for example, I, I think probably all of you are familiar with this, but not living with your parents does not create a special circumstance. That in and of itself is not sufficient. The fact that your parents are not supporting you is not a special circumstance. The fact that your parents refuse to pay for your college is not a special circumstance. The fact that your parents don't claim you on a tax return is not a special circumstance. And the fact that your parents don't want to provide their information on your FAFSA is not a special circumstance. So what we have happened sometimes is people think, oh, if I don't claim my child, they'll be independent. No, 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 no. They are not, none of these things get a student into that special circumstances category. Even if these things are true, parent information is still required on the FAFSA in order for a student to be eligible for federal financial aid. So if a student truly cannot provide parent information, 
and there's something more complicated going on here. Like there's probably a good reason why they're not living with their parents. If it's abuse or something like that, that's when they'll talk to the financial aid office. They'll provide documentation of that. School counselors, trio people, JMG people are all people who might be looked to to provide that documentation. Um, and then once they provide that to the financial aid office, they'll make a determination of whether they can do what's called a dependency override. Okay. Then if we have a situation, um, I just want to go back one more. Then we might have a situation where you saw that last one where parents refuse to provide information on the FAFSA. We had a call about this one today. Um, parents refuse to provide information. There's nothing more going on. Parents just won't give it. Sometimes it's because they're concerned about the federal government having their information, um, which they needn't be, but I know that we have people who are, are concerned about that. Then what students can do is they get the same thing. They say, I can't provide parent information. I, I, I don't have special circumstances. Um, but I want to submit my FAFSA just so I can get an unsubsidized loan only. So as a last resort, we're happy to talk to parents to see if we can convince them. Sometimes parents think that if they file the FAFSA, they're responsible for borrowing some money or that they have to pay for your, their student to go to school. None of that is true. So if we can ever help, let us know. But let's just say that the end result is parents are still refusing. Students can submit their FAFSA can indicate that they are doing it only for an unsub loan, and then they can receive an unsub loan, but they have to work with the school still. Common theme on all of these last ones. They have to reach out to the school because there is an additional form that needs to be completed. In order to be eligible for the unsub loan, the parent has to sign a form saying that I'm refusing to provide my information and I'm not financially supporting my student. If a parent does that, then the student can get the unsub loan. Now, next year, assuming the changes go through, um, the parent will only need to say, I refuse to provide my information. It won't include next year um, the requirement that parents um, not be supporting their child. All right, so that's it. And I know that was a lot. Um, so I will say for the umpteenth time, I have recorded this or we are recording this. I will send you the link so that you can fast forward through it and um, just maybe pick up on a section if you have questions. Um, I certainly will send an email, so you'll have my email if you don't already, and can ask me questions that way as well. But before we finish up, Mary, is there anything that we want to chat about? One last question. Um, what if a student was considered homeless or at risk of being homeless one year and has moved back, to, back in with their parents the following academic year? Would they maintain their independent student status or would their parents' income information be needed? Mm -hmm. So this year the student would again have to present information to the school um, that their circumstances have not changed so this year they would need to say um, they would need to provide their parent information because if they go back to the school and they say hey my situation has changed the school is going to um, you know say hey we need to see documentation if you're going to be considered homeless and you're not so so for this year um, they would the determination would have to be, let me say it this way, right now the determination has to be made every single year whether or not a student um, meets that criteria. Next year or whenever the changes go through, the default is going to be the assumption that the student remains independent or remains homeless or that their circumstances continue to exist. So it's going to go to that default assumption and only if the student indicates that their circumstances have changed would that assumption be undone? So read, read between those lines. Okay, but that's a next year change. So for this year, that student, if they're living back at home and they're no longer considered homeless, they definitely need to provide parent information on their FAFSA. And that is all for questions, Myla. All right. Well, thank you all again. I, there are some of you still with us. So um, I appreciate that. Um, I hope you all have a great day. Certainly don't have any, any hesitation about reaching out to us. Um, it's that time of year. That's what we're doing. We're answering questions and um, we're here to make it easier for you in any way we can. Um, we are having our FAFSA help sessions. We're having one um, tomorrow night or we're having a series of three tomorrow night. We're back in person. We're also doing virtual. Um, so if your students and those you're working with would like to come to event, go to famemain.com slash events and you can see where we will be.